Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Justin E.H. Smith. Justin, welcome back, and can you please introduce yourself? Hey, nice to see you again, Arya. Uh, my name is Justin E.H. Smith. Uh, I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Paris, though I'm originally American. And I also write and speak in all sorts of other non-academic contexts and under different umbrellas or caps, as we say today. <laughs> I have a substack that Arya has been reading, apparently. It's called The Internet, where I look at lots of issues broadly connected to the crisis of our current technological, cultural, political moment uh, that centers on the internet. Uh, I have a book in that connection coming out in a couple of months with Princeton University Press called The Internet Is Not What You Think It Is. And <laughs> the book sounds like what you probably think it is. So I won't describe it any more than that. And I guess finally, I also now to host a podcast called What is X? And you can find it through The Point magazine, but I'll stop the self-promotion there. Oh, okay, well, thank you for coming back on. And um, all the, yeah, links to all those things will appear on the blog Ian's site. And welcome, welcome to the podcast game, I guess. Um, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, still it's still early days, I think, in podcasting as a genre. So plenty of people are still I figured I might as well jump in, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and your, so your substack is... Justin E. H. Smith. I think that's it. Yeah, that's right. And we're going to be talking about a piece uh, that you published called Garbage Human Beings. And there's a comma after. Note garbage. the comma. Yeah. Comma, the, the comma is, comma is important. <laughs> garbage Human Beings subhead social media as the false representative class. And I thought this was really interesting. And it, it, in particular, it, well, it had a line that, uh, you know, really resonated with me. I'll, I'll, I'll just. And the line is sort of where you end up. I just want to read this and then we can you know, start at the beginning and see how you get there. And that line is, it is morally imperative to not say true things on social media. <laughs> and that uh, really um, str struck with me because as in the past couple of years, the way I've interacted with social media has been more detached, ironic, mm -hmm. and just messing around, shit posting, you know, this, um, just uh, putting things up there that are jokes or I, I think people will understand as jokes, but then sometimes there's some people who don't understand them as jokes. Mm -hmm. And I, and the, the level was, and I basically only interact uh, on Twitter at social media at this point, And the level of, yeah, sincerity in my tweets has, has plummeted over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so I found this really interesting. And so, um, yeah. It's a, so, of course, you know, I, it's something I'm doing already. If you're if you're making a moral case for it, you know, that's going to appeal to me. Uh, but we'll, we'll try to figure out uh, whether this makes sense for everyone. Right. And, and and so sort of where you well, what, one place where you sort of begin is, um, you know, there's a old line that people have used, like Twitter is not real life. Mm. And, P and that's maybe fell by the wayside over the past couple of years also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of almost saying like real life is Twitter or real life is social mm -hmm. media mm -hmm. or, or real life has come to be subsumed by what happens on social media. Mm -hmm. is it, would you agree with that? It certainly swallowed up most domains of our existence to the extent, I would argue, even when you're not using social media even when you're socializing uh, in real physical or meet space with other people, breathing on them, touching them, or <laughs> getting as close as you can. Uh, even there, I, what I would argue is there was a first stage in which social media uh, kind of swallowed up most other domains of interaction. And then there's a second, even more disconcerting stage where those interactions continue to happen out there in the so-called real world, but they're now governed by the same laws or logic, if you prefer, uh, as uh, the algorithmically unfolding interactions of the sort we know on social media, right? So there are two stages to the process. Now, as for 
uh, the uh, argument, the moral argument, and I think that's probably the the boldest thing I said I, I, I tried to do in that short piece, the moral argument that one must not say true things on social media. I confess that I frequently uh, think that I've kind of painted myself into a corner with that uh, claim because I feel the need or at least the urge on some occasions where some particular issue has me deeply uh, uh, concerned or dare I say, even I am capable of being outraged in the sense that people love to be on social media. Mm -hmm. And I start to go and say something earnest to the effect that I'm outraged. And then I'm like, wait, if I do that, then I'm contradicting myself and I pull myself back because yes, indeed. I mean, the problem is huge. I do believe that, uh, that we are, uh, uh, duty bound to not use social media as a public forum for the pursuit of deliberative democracy or something like that. Um, but moreover, I also think it's the only forum available to us at this point. And so the crisis is huge, huger than most people think, because, you know, you, yes, you should, uh, 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 not see social media as a space for the pursuit of, uh, 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 legitimate, sincere, first order, uh, goals of a political or social nature. Um, but moreover, it's all there is, right? Um, and I, I think most people have not been yet putting those two, uh, aspects of the problem together, right? Yeah, and especially during the pandemic, the, you know, once normal life receded and, and, and many people were stuck accessing uh, other, you know, quote unquote real life um, mm -hmm. through screens, then the, I don't know, it, the problem intensified mm -hmm. even more. Okay, well, 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 there's probably people, I so I am in agreement that sort of, uh, you yeah, know, trying to accomplish things through social media that where you have like real goals that you would try to accomplish in real life that it usually social media usually um distorts that or you know undermines it in some way um it, but there's probably people out there who maybe they participate less or they only mm -hmm. have a facebook account that they check you know every other day or something how would mm -hmm. you i mean what what is the case that like this you know if you uh, if you believe in some uh, movement or cause or something, and so yeah. you, you know, and, and you're moved to like write a tweet about it, you know, what it, what would you say to a person like that, just to say like, I really don't know what the answer is and right what the right balance is, and I think it's a bit like uh, in my in my forthcoming book, the, the the internet is not what you think it is. I have a discussion of. Uh, this, this sounds like a, a major tangent, but it really isn't, I promise. <laughs> uh, the er, mid-20th century environmental writer Aldo Leopold, in a book from the 1940s called Sand County Almanac, starts talking at some point about using gadgets to uh, aid in your experience of duck hunting, right? And okay. he uh, uh, makes this interesting observation that there's no precise boundary. You'll never find the precise boundary between, on the one end, uh, tools that enable you to excel at duck, duck hunting, and on the other end, tools that denature and uh, 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 pervert the, the task of duck hunting as if it were simply the accumulation of dead ducks rather than a specifically human art form, right? Does that make sense? So okay. similarly, similarly, in any technological domain, whether it's using fake, you know, fake duck calls uh, or using smartphones, I think uh, it's always going to be a uh, ultimately a personal issue 
for each person to decide on their own uh, to what extent a given technology is perverting what I'm trying to do and to what extent it's uh, uh, aiding uh, uh, or improving what I'm trying to do, right? And so we're all, and given again that social media has swallowed up absolutely everything, um, everyone is going to have to make choices that will place them probably at different points along a continuum. Now, each time I have tried to use social media, I like social media in the narrow sense, each time I've tried to use social media over the past at least 10 years to do anything serious, I've felt like it's humiliating, like it's systematically distorting and perverting what I'm trying to do, and that I can't legitimately do this. So what do I do? Well, I go out and I look for other media, and one of the media I've found for now is Substack, right? Where I can write 5,000 words that are truly in my voice, and where I can also cut off uh, the visibility of the metrics to other people. So no one knows how much other people like what I've written. And that's key because that's mm-hmm. one of the most perverting uh, tricks of social media in the narrow sense. But as I say in the piece, this isn't a fully legitimate distinction I'm making because ultimately Substack, like if you think everything is in orbit around social media, then I'd say, you know, what goes on in a school board meeting is out near Jupiter. Uh, What goes on on Substack is orbiting right outside social media's atmosphere, so to speak, (laughs) like right outside and threatens ever to be sucked in by its gravitational pull, right? It's really (laughs) close, right? Like really close. Um, to the extent that, as, as I, I think I write in the piece, if I write about something as I like to do on Substack, if I write about something totally kind of uh, irrelevant to whatever people are chattering about right now, like uh, Pliny the Elder on the source of wind or something like that, you know, my my... My few thousand loyal readers will read it. and They'll be like, yeah, we love this stuff. Justin comes up with this is so Justin and stuff like that. (laughs) Um, But if I if I want to grow my readership, I know what I have to do. And I have to do something that will be received as hot takey. Mm -hmm. um, And it has to be then uh, uh, kind of taken up in the vortex of social media in the narrow sense, right? And so Substack is a wonderful example of this because it's like, well, yes, I I can kind of feel like I'm free floating in outer space uh, here, but it's only if I look out towards space and I don't remind myself that 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 actually social media is really close when I'm doing it. Okay. You know what that, I mean? Yeah. The, 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 okay. That's a, I, that's a resonant metaphor of sort of the, um, the gravitational pull and things circling around it. And maybe even we should say that there's like a black hole at the center yeah. of this, you know, solar system. It's not a sun. Right. It's like sucking everything in and collapsing yeah. it into, you know, infinite matter or, or whatever the metaphor yeah, would be. Right. Um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll confess, I, I, I don't subscribe to your newsletter. And I saw this, I, I think I didn't, I'm sorry to say, I didn't know you had a newsletter. And I saw this piece on Twitter. And, yeah. and it was, and of course, it's about social media and, and Twitter is very like self reflective. And, and so, um, it, you know, that's, so that's perfect for going viral. And, and but yeah. also that's what you're decrying. Um, yeah. so this is complex. And you mentioned, uh, just as a side note, you mentioned, a school board meeting. I don't know if you. Maybe that, that wasn't per- the best example. Yeah, personally, because now those are really meetings, close to social media. Yeah. So school board meetings ten years ago, you know, the most boring thing you could possibly think. And I remember actually in high school we had some sort of thing in like eleventh uh, grade social studies where it was like you had to do some sort of civic participation thing, and one thing would be like going to a school board or town council meeting and sort of like writing a little report. Right. And so I did it, and I remember it, it was 
like the most boring thing I ever experienced at age 16. And I even, and I wrote it up in sort of my sarcastic way. I think the teacher appreciated it, but I was like, all these people are here. What? Like they're going off on their things. So it's both sort of, that is a proto social media. But also now with, with the, uh, there's all these movements against critical race theory, against masking in schools, whatever. Now people are staging like pseudo events at school board meetings because they're all filmed and live streamed on the, K twelve, you know, right. a school uh, school district website, and then it goes viral. Then these people get to go on Fox News and talk about how brave they were when they yeah, yelled right, right, at right. the school board members, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, right. everything is getting yeah. The gravitational pull is sweeping everything. Yeah, right, 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 um, right. So I do want to ask you about Substack because, um, you know, the yeah, Sub- Substack sort of at least the the strategy that that Substack as a corporate entity pursued. Over the past couple of years, it, as, yeah. as I saw it, was really riding Twitter's coattails, yeah, and and use and taking people who got a lot of engagement on Twitter mm-hmm. and offering them, and then Substack HQ offered some of these people, yeah, a, a deal to come yeah. write for them. And that's how they poached people like Matt Iglesias and Glenn yeah. Greenwald, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and and so Substack to me sort of seemed, and maybe it's moving beyond this now that it's getting more popular. Yeah, and even I have one now, which I mm. I've, I I I've become very delinquent in, in updating. But mm. um, yeah, the people who you know, a lot of there hasn't been, as far as I can tell, a ton of like people who I'd never heard of before who yeah. are launching a Substack where everyone's like, check this out. It's yeah. more like these are people who we sort of knew already and dominated the Twitter yeah. discourse for various reasons. Most of, most of them negative and. Yeah. And then they're like monetizing it, and they say right, they have right. a hundred thousand subscribers on on Substack, and yeah, it, it, because they because Substack saw that being controversial on Twitter is a way yeah. to get people to subscribe to the newsletter. Yeah. That's like that was yeah. a candy insight. But have you have you see? Do you agree with me that? Yeah, this? I mean it's it's curious because I think I might actually be a rare uh, exception. That is also a success story on Substack, uh, in that I've never had any contact with the people who uh, run it. I know people who did have contact beforehand. No one ever offered me any money beforehand. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yet I find that the platform just works so well for me uh, because it enables me to circumvent uh, magazine, uh, editors, uh, with whom I've had increasingly strained relations Uh as I get older and more committed to my own way of expressing things, uh, that when the possibility of monetizing 5,000 word pieces of which I am the only editor, Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm the creator and the editor, uh, this was just such a natural fit for me that I started doing it uh, every week, almost every week since August of 2020, mm-hmm. with a few weeks off when I just got too busy. Um, and my readership and my subscription rate has just been going up and up and up. Um, but I think most people who have open Substack accounts are not like that. Um for better or worse, they don't suffer from the same uh, graphomania uh, <laughs> and are kind of just uh, more balanced in their lives that they don't need to do this. Um, but for me, it works great. And so what can I say? I love Substack, right? I think it's a <laughs> wonderful thing. And because I love it, and, you know, as I've said before, people have dismissed it as a uh, blog with a payment processor, as I've said on Substack, well, a payment processor makes a big difference in yeah. determining the nature of the thing, right? Uh, right. You know, what is a restaurant but a food giveaway center with a payment processor, <laughs> right? But, you know, because the payment processor is there, it really does change the change the dynamics of it. Yeah, right? and, and so the way what you're describing seems like this is good, good for you, good for your yeah. readers, and uh, sort of the dream of the early blogosphere realized, which was mm. like smart people writing at length, and they'll they'll somehow be paid, and then yeah. I guess it, like the sort of you know the web 
made some people who wrote for the web made some collective decision to rely on advertising and not subscribers. Right. And maybe that was like a, a, a fatal turn right, right, in right, the right. development of, of the internet yeah. um, that were just like, Oh, everything will be free. And there'll just be these little ads yeah. that pay for it all. And isn't that great because you're getting the New York times for free. Whereas you used right. to have to pay 75 cents for it. Right. And that was not thought out <laughs> well and <laughs> right. possibly ruinous um, and in various ways. Results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's good. I mean, the yeah, but, you know, and so and a lot of actually the people who some of the people I mentioned previously, uh, like at least the first sort of round of Substack people mm -hmm. were just yeah. former bloggers. Matt Iglesias yeah. started out as a undergrad blogger at Harvard. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Glenn Greenwald was, you know, was a civil rights lawyer who started his yeah. own blog. And then. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah so it seems to have gone from, uh, yeah, kind of outsider to insider to sort of outsider again, right? That seems to be the general dynamics of mm -hmm. it. And of course, I, I should say that uh, if you have any kind of prominent readership on sub or significant readership on Substack, after almost every uh, new piece, um, there are inquiries from traditional venues saying, "Can we run a version of this? Can you do an, Can you do do a, a different sort of write up on the same topic?" Almost every time, right? And so. There's a strange kind of interpenetration now, and um, um, it's clearly, like it or not, um, accepted into the the broader landscape. But I, I, the reason I said I was I was singing its praises is just because uh, it's been a peculiar experience for me over the last year or so because I've heard all of this background noise about. Um, uh, the ruinous effects of Substack, right? The fact that it's, um, that it's poaching so many people with the aim to destroy ad based media. Um, and the kinds of people it was attracting has also sub been subject to a lot of, a lot of discussion. And yeah. all of that has literally just been background noise to me as I'm like, shut up. I want to write about Pliny the Elder on wind, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just been, you know, my, uh, my my kind of um personal experience yeah but and 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 one of the things that sort of was a controversy and maybe has died down was a lot of the people who they either had early success on substack or they recruited with you know a guaranteed payment um were you know uh against the progressive narrative on trans rights oh yeah and, and so that would that I, and so that would be um Andrew Sullivan would maybe be an example yeah. of that. And then I yeah. think Greenwald somewhat. And then Jesse Single, who has appeared on this program yeah. before also. Yeah. And yeah, a couple other people. And it, it but it just, yeah, I remember, sort of, yeah. it seems like Tankus, Nathan Tankus left. So. Yeah. He left the platform. Yeah. Uh, I know he was writing something about the Fed, I think. Um, yeah. he, like he was sort of a, one of the few like unknown quantities who had mm -hmm. uh, taken this, you know, he wasn't within the system. Yeah. beforehand but um but yeah it, but also so i but and so they got they caught some flack for that and then they hired some you know then they offered contracts to like various trans uh yeah. writers who and so maybe that quieted things down but it yeah. did sort of seem like sort of almost a that was like an epiphenomenon of just people who attract you know the tr trans issues are very controversial and yeah. people who attract controversy were the people who they decided to bring in and, right. and so people who write about controversial things were drawn to arguing about Trans right. issues where maybe other people had shied away from arguing about it. And, and right. so that's, that seems to me more like they weren't just like looking for anti trans commentators, just like they, they were looking for people who yeah. drive engagement, which are, and a lot of those people are controversialists or contrarians. Yeah. And, yeah. um, yeah. So that, that yeah. that's how I sort of saw it playing out. But maybe enough time has passed since that controversy. Now. Yeah. 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 I think, I think that's died down. But again, that's all just been part of the background noise for me because right. I don't care. I mean, you know, I am uh, in certain respects uh, more sympathetic to the broad swath of people who would be identified as controversialists in the contemporary climate in the United States. But mm -hmm. I hate the idea of setting myself up as one uh, in order to drive user engagement, like that's so far from my sensibilities that um, right. that um, I, I I just you know I, I I just don't do it. But at the same time, you know I do think well, what who wouldn't I write for? And indeed, there are limits to 
the venues I would write for. Um, but uh, I draw them pretty far out there mm -hmm. compared to where I think the contemporary progressive bien pensant uh, limits would be placed right? mm -hmm. in, the, in the United States, of mm -hmm. course. And, and um, so you mentioned, you know, you're writing pieces that you feel like editors wouldn't have taken um, for various reasons. How do you how do you feel like working without an editor? Because my main well, I have my two sort of overarching objections to sub, uh, Substack. One is personal, which is that I don't like reading email in general. And so when yeah, I get when I get an email, it mm. triggers a, a like a very slight like anxi anxiety reaction within me because yeah. I'm like, here's stuff. Here's some more shit I have to deal with. This is yeah, right, my reaction right, to getting right. any email. Yeah. And so I also don't like reading something very long in email. Yeah. And so yeah. this couple of newsletters I subscribe to, I put them into browser windows. This is just my own you know, yeah, right. secrecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be looking at Gmail all day long. Um, yeah. Uh, because that's annoying to me. Um, so there's that, but also the lack of the lack of an editor. And there's yeah. so, and I actually semi jokingly offered my services as a freelance Substack mm -hmm. editor over Twitter. No one, no one took me up on this, but yeah. really for a, a lot of Substacks that I've read, the, you could give them a blanket. You could give the writer a blanket admonition, you know, cut the first 250 words yeah. um, <laughs> and start there. And it just, there's a ba th things that I, you know, I, I have an editing more, much more of an editing background than a writing background, but just like yeah. basic things that an editor would tell you, especially tell someone like Glenn Greenwald, who just goes on and on and on, like cut this, cut this, start here, you know, that kind of thing. So, I, yeah, how do you think about that? Look, I, I don't mean to sound um, totally kind of unhinged, but there is no obvious reason to me why writing skills and editing skills should not be combined in one and the same person. Mm -hmm. um, and it's simply not like being your own defense attorney. Um, it is something very different. It's like, I mean, there are art forms like painting. Imagine if painters had some guy who stood over their shoulder and said, no, no, you're going to want to add a few more brush strokes right there. <laughs> okay. Like, Get away from me. I'm the painter. Right now. That's not to say that painters don't have to learn from other people. It's just that you pass through a sort of, um, uh, uh, uh apprenticeship and then you reach a point where, where people recognize you as someone who can do the thing on their own, right? Now, it doesn't seem to me in principle why we couldn't think of writing in the same way, mm -hmm. right? And now, is that to say that um, that that what you're getting is necessarily going to be as polished as what you would find in, say, The New Yorker in something that's been gone over and over and over and over again before it reaches the public? No, of course not. But isn't there something valuable in seeing what comes directly from the source that you lose when writing becomes a uh, an assembly line process, right? I mean, I can think of, you know, there are, uh, well, this is a weird example, and I'm not a fan, but I think of the Russian radical extremist reactionary writer, Edward Limonov. Um, who for a while was writing for an English language newspaper in Moscow. I forget which one. And he said, look, I'll do it on one condition. You don't correct my English. Right. Um, and, uh, so I want my raw shitty English out there in the world to be read because that's, you know, that's my voice. And reading that, which I, I remember doing at the time some years ago, was like, you know, a jolt and it was terrible English, but it was worth reading, right? So what I want to say is, um, first of all, I think my readers will agree that I'm a pretty, pretty good auto editor. Mm -hmm. Um, but also that when I, uh, meander or, uh, take a detour or add a parenthesis or do all of these crazy things that I know I wouldn't be allowed to do if per impossibile I were ever published in the New Yorker. When I'm doing those things, um, it's because the whole, the rule of the game here is an unmediated encounter with 
a certain person's voice. Mm -hmm. And again, we're all here voluntarily. Like if you don't like it, you can, you can leave. Right. Um, But again, I think there's a need for that kind of space. And this is my last point on the topic. I think if you go back to, you know, what was allowed to be published in, I don't know, in, in, in Playboy in 1965, you get a lot more of that raw stuff, right? Of people who, for whatever reason, are held up as having the right to hold forth in their own voice. And these days, there's very little of it. So in a way, it's a pushback against, um, against uh, not polish so much as homogenization. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so much as the imposition of a house style where the house now is just, um, you know, a general culturally shared uh, way of way of expressing ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. OK, that that's sense? interesting. You, you make a, you make a good case. I'll, we don't need to get, you know, uh, have a tangent here. I'll just briefly speak up for the uh, craft <laughs> or art or whatever, or the practice sure, of sure. editing. Uh, and, and so I would just say. Um, well, most, uh, uh, so you may be able to produce, uh, you know, clean copy and cogent material. Um, but, you know, and, and the, the metaphor or the, the analogy to the, uh, you know, a, a painter who has someone standing over their shoulder saying, Oh, I think you need a little more blue here. Well, that's, that made me laugh, but also like, um, maybe the editor is more like the gallerist who is collecting yeah. things or the yeah. museum curator, but also, you know, uh, and it, like everyone, not everyone can paint. Like I don't own any paint, but I. But as <laughs> Twitter and social media shows, anyone can type out letters and make words yeah. and make sentences. Um, and so that so you know literacy is much more universal than the ability to paint or draw. And yeah. so maybe it'd be more like you know everyone has you know like doodling in your notebook or something, or you know even maybe more just like making sounds or something like that's yeah. sort of where we are in social media, where it, the, like the garbage. You know, we're right. inundated in garbage. And yeah. um, and so you would hope that the good stuff rises to the top. Yeah. And, you know, Glenn Greenwald, I assu- assume, is has hundreds of thousands of subscribers. He's an awful writer, in, yeah. my, in my personal opinion. And, and longtime listeners know I have a running mostly one way, um, you know, a feud with Glenn Greenwald. He did block me on Twitter. So it's at least a somewhat two way feud. But um, yeah, he just the man can't write. He's a lawyer. Um, he, mm. he, he writes as a lawyer would argue. And right. um and I, I I find it unreadable and it shows yeah. so there's so when he suddenly when he like left the intercept and his grand thing you know with his moral dudgeon and so forth it was pretty clear like oh they were actually working with him a lot to edit this shit down to make it more <laughs> right yeah, 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 yeah presentable yeah. or more readable yeah. so again it's it's you know if you write for the New Yorker they're gonna put a di- diuresis however you say that word or above yeah. the, you know the second letter O and cooperate and so you yeah. have to bow to that. But yeah. they're also kind of like correct your your grammar mistakes yeah. and and so forth. So so yeah. okay. So, so. I, I, look, I I agree with you. I I can think of some cases. I don't see any reason to name names of people I've also admired in uh, mainstream publications, and then I've read them on Substack, and I've been somewhat horrified. Yeah, like I, I've I've had exactly <laughs> the same experience, and we're all different. One of my favorite Substacks, I'll give a shout out to him, is Nick Pinkerton who's a a film critic uh, and, you know, has lost employment because because movies are such crap these days. And, uh, you know, there's there's no real kind of film work for real film critics. Mm -hmm. And his sub stacks are works of pure genius, like every single one is a masterpiece, no matter what he's writing about. And he made a comment one time where he said, like, look, I like to work with editors. uh, And uh, if I'm not working with an editor, I can do it myself. And then he said, because I'm not a big baby. Right. (laughs) Like his, you know, some of us just, I share that attitude, right? Like, like if you can write, you, you, part of that means editing yourself, right? Of course it does. Okay. But but (laughs) the people who rise to the top on social media, often are big babies and, and acting like a big baby <laughs> is a way to attract attention right. on, um, yeah, yeah, on Twitter. And I don't, and you know, the, the person who I previously mentioned is having a feud with often yeah. acts like either a big baby or a petulant <laughs> teenager or something and continues to 
uh, uh, you know, rake in more dollars from loyal subscribers. Um, yeah. Okay, but let's so let's let's get back to sort of the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, your your main thrust about how you know like people are doing things in the real world, like canny people. And you mentioned AOC and the dress she wore oh, yeah. to the yeah. Met Gala. Yeah. That you know, which said if, if people somehow miss this, she wore like a white gown to the Met Gala. Uh, which is this supposed fundraiser for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but it's really like way for celebrities to wear these crazy, you know, designer outfits, costumes or whatever, and get attention for themselves and the designers to get attention also. And so she wore a white gown and on the back it said, tax the rich, right? Yeah, tax the rich. In yeah. like red paint or something. And mm. and so everyone was talking about this. And and I, I know she, she pissed off people who generally like her uh, for various reasons, attending this event with the moneyed, you know, the money to leap. Um, yeah. In which she was wearing a garment that you know cost tens of thousands of dollars. I think people were mad at the designer, who of course almost any you know anyone who works in fashion, there's some sort of like ethical compromise that's being made in the production of clothing we wear today. Um, so we don't need to get into that. But yeah, so but so people, you know, so the Ben Shapiro types were mad at her, but then other people who maybe would have you know, support her politics were mad at her also, and then other people were like, oh, this is great, she looks great, you know, blah blah, what a mm-hmm. great message. And so people were talking and I guess your interpretation of like, oh, she knows she knew she knew what she was doing. She knew that she was this this was a performative act, not for the Met Gala. It was for social media and to get attention for herself. Of course, of course. I, I think I mean, it's just obvious that an event like that at this point, uh, you cannot kind of draw the boundaries of the event around the building it takes place in. Um, and not for us, the uninvited, but also <laughs> not for the participants. I'd imagine what it's like to be there primarily is to be there in anticipation of the social media waves, right? Yeah, and you know, I, um, this is the just, I mean, it's interesting, this particular event, which before a couple of years ago, I'd never even heard of. And yeah. then, I, but I think it is a long lasting event. Like at least goes back to the nineties. Yeah. And, but it was something that, you know, in 1997, it would just be like, there'd be like a two page spread in Vogue or something. Yeah. With the, the best yeah. looks. Yeah. But then it, it turned into this like annual cultural event that every, and everyone and the way people consume it is like yeah. on, on social media and people like reposting the photographs of the best or worst yeah. costumes and stuff. And so, yeah, but it, yeah. it didn't. It wasn't originally that. It's but it's like tur- turned into right. that. It still yeah. is ostensibly yeah. a fundraiser, yeah. but yeah. So it's all it's all interactive. It's all multimedia, like everything at this point. And I think I sincerely think that AOC has conceived her career um, along those lines from the very beginning. Now I also mentioned Trump, and Trump is a bit of a more difficult case because obviously his career long precedes social media. But uh, AOC, I think, is young enough to be uh, uh, characterized by this new set of rules where uh, to be prominent uh, in any field, including being elected to the House of Representatives, pales in comparison to uh, social media cloud, right? to uh, good metrics on social media. Um, And that's pretty disconcerting. Uh, It certainly uh, has deformed in obvious ways, higher education, film, uh, book publishing, and so on. And I think what's becoming increasingly clear is that it's moving on from there to kind of the even more foundational institutions of society, like electoral politics, and even with uh, with things like meme stocks now, even economics, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, it's uh, 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 been a uh, 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 pretty steady uh, expansion of the domain of. Uh, uh, social media's appetite for human society, say, over the past five or six years. Yeah, and the, the stuff that's happening with 
as we mentioned earlier, with like school board or town council yeah. meetings where people are going. And I get, and this has, you know, the, the, it interacts with like more traditional media, like cable news, because if something is really wild and really goes crazy online, then it'll yeah. end up on Tucker Carlson or Rachel Maddow yeah. or something like that. Um, but yeah, people going and um, obviously putting on some kind of performance, yeah. even if it's not like a super, like, like maybe, like maybe like, you know, the anti-vaxxers who are testifying and like, weeping tears and and the people i don't know if you've seen the clips of the people who think that the the um the vaccine just magnetized their skin and then they're like yeah. putting like a spoon up against their skin or something it's <laughs> i mean I'm, maybe they totally yeah. believe this but it's just like the the incentives encourage this sort of behavior and so more like society produces it because the incentives um yeah encourage it in some way i was i was visiting the united states i was and i was at my my mother's house who has msnbc on all the time now um, and, you know, that was never the case when I was growing up, <laughs> you know, we, we consumed very little news, you know, 60 minutes once a week mm -hmm. with these authoritative figures, um, talking about important things. And now she has MSNBC on all the time. And honestly, what it struck me as was a sort of, uh, unidirectional news feed, right? Where she doesn't get to, you know, click on anything, but she's still getting this kind of filter down from whatever's trending, right? Mm -hmm. In a in a way that you get more or less in your recent trends column on the right side of your of, of your Twitter, mm -hmm. right? It's it's very very um uh much a, a clear example of you know again if Substack is uh like the the um. The, the International Space Station orbiting social media, MSNBC is like a little piece of space junk that's really like 10 seconds away from being sucked in and burning out in the atmosphere of social media. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that that's true. And yeah, the um, uh, the way that cable news, you know, in the 90s, it was, you know, you would probably just see one image at a time or maybe a split screen or something. And there wasn't like all this text on the screen, but then, you know, the, the, the scroll uh, at the bottom came in after nine yeah. 11. And that is sort of a proto yeah. Twitter yeah. type thing of constant, right. you know, something is there's, there's multiple streams happening constantly at the same time. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Let's, uh, let's talk about another interesting point you make about like hate. The internet runs on hate. Uh, oh. you, uh, I'll, I'll just read an excerpt here. Um, yeah. Uh, da, da, da. okay. So hate clicking, you talk about hate clicking, you talk about the one specific article that sounded absurd that ran in Scientific American. And, oh, yeah. and I, I've had this theory too, actually, that there's a specific outlets. Social media strategy is to tweet things that they know people are going to dislike or yeah. misread in a particular way. And then it goes viral and people end up clicking on the article, um, yeah. in order to, so they're like the social media managers or whatever are, in my theory, actively sabotaging um, like their writer's work and misrepresenting yeah. it in specific ways, they'll rile up the mob, yeah. and yeah. then it gets yeah. gets everyone pissed off, and then this translates into higher traffic uh, yeah. than, it, than it would have otherwise if they had like accurately represented what yeah. the article was or something. Um, yeah. And you know, the headlines have been around for a long time. People have like exaggerated headlines and so forth, but um, it does seem like they're you know the the strategy, at least at some outlets, and like the Hill would be one of them in particular, yeah. is let's make people mad on Twitter and that will yeah. help us in the end, even if it's not really true or, yeah. or whatever. And then you, you know that the internet runs on hate. And um, so a quoting from the piece, ordinarily we take this to mean that it incites people to argue pointlessly, to abandon the ordinary ethical norms governing disagreement and so on. Uh, this sense of the claim is true, but another respect to which the internet is an engine of hate is what I've just identified that in click seeking, there is no incentive to weed out hate clicking. And this sort of leads to more of the argument about, like, like, there's no point in like trying to be truthful or right. like, you know, conduct yourself in a the way you would in real life on social media because it yeah. like everything has been flattened to this plane yeah. where like morals yeah. don't matter anymore. Maybe maybe I'm going a little yeah. too far, but how, how would well, you look, describe? No, that? I mean, first of all, yeah, why, why editors get to choose your the title of your piece is something I will never be able to tolerate. You know, I, another another argument for moving to Substack. You can choose your own titles. Yeah, I, it had some. <laughs> I assume it had some original reason, especially newspapers, because they would assemble yeah. 
you know, with yeah, yeah, yeah. actual yeah. type, the, you know, back the in the day. And so type, the, the headlines yeah. sometimes would shrink in size. And so a copy editors would write yeah. headlines because they were yeah. the ones like assembling, physically assembling the paper. But it, this convention continues on. Yeah. And, but now you're absolutely right. Uh, the reason that's left to the editors is because the editors are the ones who are most concerned about search engine optimization and are most concerned about generating clicks where, again, uh, the click can be motivated by any affect, including hate, right? Again, a hate click is as, is as, as good as a support click for driving up traffic. Right. Um, and, uh, that is, obviously going to incentivize a kind of race to the bottom. The Scientific American article, uh, as far as I could tell, I guess, in some science research communities and in uh, science departments and universities, people use the phrase JEDI or the acronym JEDI uh, to uh, express a commitment to values of i forget what the j stands for but justice then, maybe just yeah sorry justice, justice equity, equity diversity, diversity and inclusion, inclusion. So, or yeah. something like that yeah so so there was an editorial published in scientific american that was seriously i'm not making this up uh devoted to explaining all the reasons why jedi is problematic because the jedis in star wars are not committed to social justice in the right ways. And this was an editorial in Scientific American. <laughs> it's, it's just astounding the, the, um, the, the transformation and the levels of rhetoric at, and uh, 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 in the United States over the past over the past decade. So then you go and you, you look for who's responsible for this. And you find on Twitter, the editor of Scientific American writing in all caps, this is so good, uh, you know, exclamation points. Um, and so you can't turn to the editor and say, what has gone wrong here? How did this slip through? Because the editor is evidently fully behind this. Um, so when you see this, again, you are in a position to be convinced that uh, that that it's best to withdraw. It's best not to uh, tweet at the editor. This is bad. This is good. <laughs> or do better, as people like to say. But simply to withdraw and to try to carve out some other discursive space where you can say things that matter somewhat more than whether we should be using the acronym JEDI or not. Yeah. And just to um, emphasize, so I, I clicked on that article, of course, so I, I fell into the trap too. They got one more click for me and, yeah. um, and you was scanned it briefly, but I had to leave because it was so dumb. But yeah, they were saying like the JEDI in Star Wars are ableist. And so this is not, you know, we should not use this acronym JEDI. So it was just the stu like something that you know some right wing comedian would have made up as yeah. a parody of it's, social yeah, justice yeah, yeah. language or something. It was it was so silly and yeah, and this everyone, August Scientific American running it was I mean, the chair. The, the cake. editor, the editor seems sincerely to believe in it. One honestly thinks that everyone behind this must be vote motivated by cynicism, but the truth is, I don't know. I can't tell anymore. Um, and that feeling of not knowing whether it's cynicism or true idiocy um, is so alienating. It makes a person feel so lost in our society. Um, and again, uh, so much in need of carving out uh, uh, at least a semi-autonomous space um, where the where you can ignore the prevailing rules of discourse. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, but that brings me to the, 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 the question of garbage, right? Uh, Cause I mean, I've been irked by this phrase for a long time, but you know, whenever you see some high traffic uh, tweet with lots of comments on it, uh, like say uh, Sally Rooney's uh, 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 decision not to have, her book translated into Hebrew mm -hmm. for a particular Israeli publishing house. Um, you know, it's so kind of standardized by now. You'll get uh, a dozen people uh, saying variations of, 
uh, well, that gives me an excuse not to read her now. And then uh, every every 12 or 13 will say, never heard of her. <laughs> you know, it's so predictable. <laughs> and then there will be another dozen saying, that gives me an excuse not to read her. But then, of course, inter- interspersed in there, you'll also get uh, a couple almost every time. You'll also get someone writing garbage human being or <laughs> trash or vile. And, right. you know, this is language that is so, it's what, you know, what Heidegger would call geplapper, right? It's, it's like, it's what <laughs> Das Mann says. It's, it's like, it's not actual language that people use. It's just language that's being funneled through people, right? <laughs> um, who don't actually know what they're saying. Right. And, and I, I assume there were also, an equal number of people who are saying, yes, queen, finally, someone is standing oh, yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm o- o- clicking, ordering that book right now. And it's, yeah, yeah. so. oh, yeah, of course, that's the, that's the other side. I mean, I mean, yeah, uh, like, like the Sally Rooney Israel combination brought out Philistines of all kinds uh, <laughs> to say variously that they either are or are not now going to read our novels as if as if as if that had anything to do with whether you should read our novels or not yeah it's um, funny the way you just fit phrase that made me think that there's almost like there's someone behind the curtain they have two big wheels and they spun <laughs> one and, and they spun the other and it came up that the sally rooney that the da, da, israel like okay that's what it is for today it's sally Ro- and then tomorrow yeah. it will be you know two other random things smashing together um yeah. <laughs> to fuel our you know fuel our outrage and and so forth yeah. um yes so much so the, the, i mean and you know she had sally rooney uh who's been sort of crowned the like young millennial uh novelist of the age or something um you know she uh if people weren't paying attention to this, you know, at first uh, it seemed to have been misreported initially and that made people angrier yeah. than what was actually happening. And so it was initially reported that she wasn't allowing her new book to be translated into Hebrew. Um, it seems like what actually happened was that she denied her previous, her previous two novels had been translated into Hebrew and she said she wasn't going to re up the contract or something. And this yeah. was possibly th- through mistranslation or maybe more cynical means was taken to mean she wasn't going to let it, be translated to Hebrew at all. And then it's like, yeah. okay, Hebrew is a language, but it's the language, it's the language of only one state, which is the state of Israel, which people have very strong opinions of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, tur- it turns out that it's, yeah, it seems like it was just her contract with this particular Hebrew translator. She didn't want it, but then she said, if there was a Hebrew translator that uh, complied with the uh, BDS protocols, you know, boycotts, def- uh, disinvestment mm. sanctions. I think that's what, that's yeah. what that stands for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then she would be happy to publish in Hebrew, but one has to think, yeah. What is the audience for Sally Rooney in Hebrew to begin with? It can't be that big because there's Mm. fewer that I was trying to figure this out. Actually, how many people are fluent in Hebrew uh, and read in Hebrew to begin with? It's fewer than 10 million. So this is not Mm. like saying we're not going to translate this into Spanish or, you know, Mandarin or something. But Mm. then, you know, the American could she find an American translator from English into Hebrew who Mm. would support BDS but really, right. well, what, you know, that would be a, a little bit strange, um, well, but, but who so, knows? Yeah. And so the whole thing, like, it had a surface level that was getting people angry. The truth was yeah. more complex. It seemed ultimately stupid uh, and sort of a non-controversy, but it did have sort of deep things related to, yeah. you know, the uh, participation of uh, the Jews of the world in the yeah. in world culture. So it, had, yeah. it was a perfect, perfect storm. And yeah, okay, well, let me so custom made for social media, yeah, exactly. And you know, and the truth, you know, who forget who even cares at this point because we've all <laughs> had our fun. Okay, well, let me so then getting back to your thing about not tweeting, you know, there's you have a moral imperative to not tweet the truth. Yeah. Okay, so this is the style of tweet that I've arrived at for myself, and I, you know, reading your own tweets on a podcast is you know, a debased form of, <laughs> of living. But this is what I actually, uh, I, I, I was sitting on a park bench this morning, drinking my coffee and I had this joke came into my mind and I tweeted it. And you can tell me how, how if you think this is moral, amoral it's or good use of Twitter or, or, ne- or neither. <laughs> I said, uh, wait, so Don's kidney donation went to a quote, anonymous millennial Irish aspiring novelist End quote, how is this only being reported now? Okay. So this is like, a shit level post like seven layers down yeah, because you have yeah. to also understand that there was this controversy involving an article called yeah. bad art friend that yeah, involved sure. kidney donation. And so I'm making sort of a 
strange meta joke that it got two likes, so people did not appreciate this joke at all. <laughs> but I'm saying that, like, we're only finding out now that, that the woman who donated a kidney actually donated it to Sally Rooney. And, <laughs> and somehow this fact is only emerging now. So that's the style of joke that entertains myself when I'm sitting on a park bench and it pops into yeah. my brain and Twitter has rewired my brain such that the jokes <laughs> appear formatted yeah. for a tweet. And then if I don't tweet right. it, it stays in my head and I keep on thinking right. like refinements to it. So I just tweet it. And maybe someone right. smiles about it. So uh, right, you, right, right. Uh, as, as a philosopher, would you approve of this style of just sort of fucking around with the, with the discourse in general? Well, or, or should I just delete the app and you know, move into the woods or something? Well, that, that question is quite separate from, from whether I think the joke lands. Right. <laughs> um, but um, look, I think, I mean, obviously, there's something curious going on here where there's on Twitter, uh, what you could call the uh, kind of the latest iteration of the aesthetics of the mashup, um, which kind of goes back to the aesthetics of the cut up in the uh, uh, mid 20th century, right? The where, you know, people juxtapose sharply uh, uh, distinct elements against one another and the whole kind of, um, uh, fashion of portmanteau, uh, uh, Twitter handles, uh, like Kim Kierkegaard Ashian, but, you know, then all of this ridiculous stuff that people come up with, uh, kind of expresses the spirit of Twitter where you, you, you mash incongruous things up together. Yeah. And, and, for and yeah, or, or combining, yeah, combining little ideas yeah. with puns often. And so puns yeah, are sort of yeah, like the lowest yeah. form of humor, maybe, but, uh, but also, um, you know, sort of the interchangeability of memes where the yeah. memes that are most effective are like sort of a can sort of a blank canvas where you can plug in various things and, the, and you still get a little joke that works. And so like the distracted boyfriend meme, like lives yeah, on right, right, in right. glory yeah. or infamy because it, yeah, it expresses yeah. some like core truth about like, yeah. you know, seeing something new and then you can, right. it, you can plug in an infinite number of things from culture or yeah. politics or anything yeah. into that the one particular one. Yeah. The distracted boyfriend meme is really, really, it's really, it's really one of the, it's <laughs> probably yeah. the best meme of the past five years, at least. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a great one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, but, sorry, yeah, but so look, look, so what's, what's, what's curious though is, for better or worse, that is the, that's what Twitter is capable of successfully delivering to us. And the tragedy is that it's also home base for reporters, for journalists, um, who are not supposed to be doing that kind of work, who don't have a genealogy that goes back to uh, William S. Burroughs cut-ups or plunder phonics or negative land, you know, these experimental uh, 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 sound art kind of mish, uh, mix, m mixes that they started doing in the 70s and 80s. There's like nothing about uh, uh, Capitol Hill reporting that belongs in such a milieu, right? And it's just ridiculous that, that those people are professionally obligated to hang out in that milieu. <laughs> yeah. And then what's the, what's the most painful is when they start to see it as in their own professional interest to play along, even if their individual humor or sensibility doesn't really prepare them for that. It's absurd. Yeah. Of, it's sick. It's broken. Um, but you're using Twitter just fine. I approve. <laughs> okay. That's, well, all it's, that's all it's good Well, thank for. you for coming on today. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, so there's people, and I actually, I had it. Where else am I going to say this stuff? But on Twitter, just a couple of days ago, I, I had the thought, um, can you imagine if people were live tweeting during the Sopranos finale? Um, mm -hmm. where there was the infamous uh, cut to black and everyone freaked out and didn't know what was going on and how horrible that would have been if like Matt Iglesias and Josh Barrow were like trading the same obvious <laughs> jokes immediately <laughs> afterwards and getting hundreds of retweets for it. And that, and, 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 and you know, that was 2007, I think. And, and so Twitter mm. was around for just a year and no one was, and I actually, yeah. someone was like, oh, I'm sure people were live tweeting then. So I actually used the advanced Twitter search and went back and was looking at 
tweets from the date of the Sopranos finale <laughs> to see what people were saying. And it is somewhat interesting because the way the form has changed. So people were saying, going to watch Sopranos tonight. And then, and then people were saying, wow, Sopranos, that was crazy. Like, what? I didn't like that. But there was, and there was like two people who were actually tweeted during the show. One was saying, this finale is not very good so far. And like a couple other people being like, wow, what's happening? This is weird. Because, you know, back then. That's amazing. That's like real historical. Yeah, research. I was really, it was, I felt you like I was in the, the archives, archives or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, and I found some, I, one of the guys who I found, he's still on Twitter and he was like, oh yeah, I remember that. Like I, I retweeted his thing. So he was alerted. So that's kind of fun. But anyway, yeah. And whereas now live, live tweeting something you're watching on TV is, you know, yeah. hundreds of thousands of people are doing it constantly. And yeah. the, the, that the aesthetic effect that was created from the Sopranos finale you know, you could not do that now because, first of all, it would probably leak what they what they were doing. Someone would have leaked it beforehand. Um, right. Maybe not, but you know, but everyone would have immediately tur- like memified it. It would have been yeah. ten thousand jokes with stuff of people cutting together videos or something where like you know something cut the blacks like uh, Neil Armstrong walking yeah. in the moon uh, cuts the black and <laughs> and it would be driven into the ground within hours yeah. and the you know yeah. et cetera et cetera you, you so know, like. It's, to my mind, like, look, obviously, social media has fundamentally transformed television and any uh, kind of comparable domain of cultural expression. And that's fine. Whatever. Television was never going to last forever. It's become interactive. It's become something that people take up and collectively transform into memes and so on. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. I, I never cared about, about preserving the purity of TV series in the first place. What's worrisome is when elected figures uh, are similarly kind of the product of collective engagement on social media, like I was arguing AOC is. That's when we have a real problem. Right. And and so you let's talk about a term that you used in the in the subhead, which uh, you picked because it's your oh, subject, yeah. which is the false representative class. Yeah. Can, can you explain that that angle? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, it seems, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, I had that whole thing in there. That, that's going to take us a bit over time. So let's, uh, let's just spend like two minutes. Okay. On this. Um, uh, 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 so I have kind of a theory and, you know, this is something that's, I, I forget where, uh, who expressed it exactly like this, that, um, you know, there was a long aspiration from the Renaissance on, uh, to universal literacy, right. And developed nations could claim 99.9 literate percent literacy, and that was seen as a great achievement. There's now a different sort of aspiration, which is universal authorship, right? Um, we're all now writing in the same way that it was once expected that we would all read. So the scope of what it is that citizens of uh, modern developed republics do um, has expanded in that way from you know a small class of li- the literate to universal readership from a small cl- class of scribes to um, a universal participation in um, some kind of uh, neo scribal activity, right? Um, and there are other respects in which this happens, and I'm not the per- first person to argue this, but you know what you see in the rise of the bourgeois class, uh, in the rise of uh, the values of modern domesticity, is in a certain sense the spread or the universalization of um, what had once been held to be noble or aristocratic or even royal uh, 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 activities and forms and symbols and so on. And so I mentioned the example of the ceremony that happens in a Long Island wedding palace strip mall uh, joint, right? Like, what is that but a kind of uh, popularized expression of some kind of 
fantastic idea of royalty, right? Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of examples of this, of this spread. Now, what I meant by the false representative class, and here I'm borrowing this expression from Joan Didion, who used the phrase false ownership class for those people who uh, got terrible mortgages uh, because they were so uh, convinced that they were prepared to belong to the ownership class that they were ready to sign on, even though, in fact, what they remained was the underclass, right? So they lost out when the bubble burst because they were false owners. Similarly, one might argue that something remarkable has happened over the past decade where all of a sudden everybody takes themselves to be at a individualized level, a representative of what exactly? It's not clear because they're, they're representatives of one, but as a representative of one, you still have to speak and issue statements as if you were AOC, right? And um, it's, it's hilarious. So I mentioned in that context, the classic Onion headline from right after su September mm -hmm. 11th, where the Dinty Moore soup, canned soup company takes a firm stand against terrorism, right? Which seemed just ridiculous in 2001. And I, I well remember when it came out and, I, and laughing about it. Um, and now not only is Dinty Moore taking stands, but each and every one of us <laughs> is similarly kind of expected to, again, to act as if we were representatives of something so that, you know, something happens in the world and you were like, oh, I was going to tweet my joke, but I better wait six hours right. because a bunch of people just got shot or something like that. It's so absurd. Yeah. And it's such a such a mis uh, representation of what the role of the citizenship uh, of the citizen is. It's a distortion. And one also suspects a kind of bubble that has to burst in the same way the subprime mortgage bubble burst. We can't go we on can't, like this. We can't go on. And yet, you know, we go on, um, you know, to quote uh, another great work of the 20th century. Um, yeah. But yeah, OK. And, and the and, and sort of the Dinty Moore thing, like, became satire became reality last year when, like, uh, like uh, Gushers or Skittles or something was tweeting, like, you know, we just want you to know that Gushers support, believes that Black Lives Matter and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and so it just you know, reached these levels of absurdity. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, each individual person feels feels compelled to also say that either Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter, whichever side of the tribal divide they're on, and then possibly their friends are getting mad at them if they don't post this. Yeah. This is happening on Instagram more maybe than on Twitter or if people weren't posting like the black blackout black square thing. People were looking yeah. askance at them, like, "What you don't you don't believe Black Lives Matter? Like, why don't you know? Why don't you join up?" Kind of thing, and yeah. so that's maybe that's a little bit like the uh, another old, old joke um, for the Seinfeld episode where um, with the um, where Kramer is at the AIDS march, but he doesn't want to wear the ribbon. Um, you know, it's like you need to sig signal your um, signal your allegiance, even though he's doing it. And what for whatever reason, Kramer just says, "I don't want to wear the ribbon," and he ends up getting beat up by the other uh, marchers at the AIDS march for not wearing the ribbon, um, and. <laughs> yeah, so 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 satire has become reality. I, I, there was other, one other thing we've done a little bit longer than we thought. But did you? I don't know how much time you actually spent on Twitter. The fact that you're producing, you know, five thousand words a week of Substack means you're probably not wasting a ton of time on Twitter, and so that is laudatory. But did you see the debate that was happening around the Kellogg's strike and people boycotting Kellogg's? Did you see this one? Um, I. Vaguely, I, I I knew there was a strike against Kellogg's. I I knew that someone claimed what was it? Someone claimed some kind of disability that uh, that restricted her to only eating <laughs> frosted mini Yes. Meats. Okay. So just to, so yeah, to give the background of this, in in reality, the workers at either nationally or one particular Kellogg's plant were going on strike, and so you know, plenty of people believe it's their ethical duty to honor that strike and not cross the picket line or what, in, you know, what by, or 
by purchasing Kellogg's products while in, while the workers are still on strike. So that's fine. That's well established in the culture. And then someone um, tweeted something like, well, I have like so a, a d- disability such I'm extremely sensitive to texture uh, when it that's comes to eating. And the only thing I eat is this one particular brand of Kellogg's cereal. And, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? Or like, how can you tell me I'm a bad person if I keep on buying this? Like, I will start for this if I don't get this. Um, and then this sparked a, yeah, so people who are very angry about this and debating it, it seems like the original, it seems like the post may have been a troll. Um, yeah. That this was not, there's not actually a person who only eats one particular brand of Kellogg's cereal for their entire diet. You would probably die if you did. I mean, maybe you would yeah. have to take some. Develop other disabilities. Yeah, yeah. I, you I would have to be that. taking supplements or something if, if you were doing this. But um, <laughs> but the fact that, okay, people bought, you know, people believe this and pe- and it entered the discourse such that you were seeing lots of people who have like anime avatars and, and so forth or like Karl Marx, you know, with glowing <laughs> eyes avatars were like going back and forth. Like, no, you well, I'm sorry that you only eat, um, you know, you you only eat uh, this brand of Kellogg cereal. But like too bad, because like when there's a boycott, you have to respect it. And 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 it's, so it was absurd on his face. It, it was a troll and it wasn't really happening anyway. It can, you know, people got <laughs> emotionally excited about it. But yeah. it also sort of it was like. Set, like people set up these ethical rules for themselves, and it was like, okay, here's some sort of ethical dilemma, even though it turned out to be imaginary. And it was like, so it enabled everyone to feel more morally superior in some way. Where the ultra, you know, the ultra lefty union supporters were like, well, you know, uh, the iron jawed angels, you know, they died too for their beliefs. And then the like people who are <laughs> concerned about disability rights and you know ableism and so forth were like, well, it turns out that there is still one prejudice. That is acceptable in polite society, which is against people with severe textural, you know, swallowing (laughs) disabilities, which I don't know if it actually exists or not. Maybe it does. But it it was it was, you know, Twitter throws up these bizarre microcosms of how stupid it is every day. And and so I don't know. But it was it it, it was a perfect encapsulation of of the of various interesting stupidities that that Twitter has brought forth in the uh, the populace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's a lovely example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, it's 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 fine if it's 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 hilarious. It's uh, it's ribald. It's uh, carnivalesque. It's all sorts of terms apply. Uh, the only problem is when it's the only game in town. You know, that's my. That's my line. On yeah. And it's funny because we, you know, our previous conversation was about, I believe, an op-ed you wrote in the Times that was called something like the end of satire. And oh, yeah. Um, and yeah. you're, I mean, talking political satire mainly, but also how reality had become so strange that, you know, there were things that satire oh, and reality right, yeah. seemed to merge. And so th- we're yeah. still sort of in that space, but also like, the, whatever you know, teenage jokester came up with this idea to say, I, c- I can only eat, you know, I'm gonna die if I don't eat this one brand of Kellogg's cereal. That, like, yeah. maybe that's the modern satirist is there, like, fucking yeah, around yeah, yeah. and pissing yeah. people off and yeah. and so forth. And, yeah. and so, I, I actually choked on Twitter, of course, that like, if a troll can spark a discourse, that's like the ultimate, you know, the ultimate mm. victory for the troll because, yeah, right, right, you know, right, tens right, of thousands right. of people were thinking about this idea right, that was right, totally right, right. <laughs> made up just to piss people off or screw with people or for whatever reason. Right. And so, yeah, and then it just rolls on. And, you know, by the time this post, people have, will have forgotten probably about Sally Rooney and kidney donations and <laughs> because there'll be 10,000 other things to get mad about. And, and that's, right, right, that's right. the, that's what we right. live in. Um, yeah. Okay. So maybe we should end it there, but um, <laughs> so links to the things we mentioned, including your sub stack will be below on the blog site. And anything else you want to mention? Um, you mentioned your book title, but you want to say it again for a book that yeah, coming yeah. Out? It's called "The Internet Is Not What You Think It Is." It's already available for pre-order. Cool, and maybe you can hopefully come back on at some point to discuss that because oh, yeah. it's definitely Absolutely. fits within the themes Absolutely. that I'm interested in yeah. and yeah, yeah, discussed yeah. on this yeah. show. And so, um, uh, so I need to uh, have more. I need to do more self promotion than I usually do, which is you know, uh, I I, re- I just spun off. Blogging adds into its own YouTube channel. It still appears on the podcast feed and the bloggingheads.tv homepage. But if you are still watching this, you are watching it on the culturally determined YouTube channel. And then if you subscribe to that, then that helps more people see the content. And if you hit that 
like, you know, slam that subscribe button and hit like and so forth. And as you are as you were describing the, um, you know, the things that like the uh, royalty once did now, like the commoners do it. I was thinking that, you know, <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down in like yes. the, you know, uh, oh, yes. Greek, um, you know, in gladiator, you know, he does thumbs up or thumbs yes. down of whether the, the, the person will yes. be saved. And that's Joaquin Phoenix as the, you know, Greek or Roman Empire emperor. <laughs> and now we all get to do thumbs up or thumbs down. And so if you <laughs> hit thumbs up, then that helps me in some way, I suppose. And so, uh, well, you might as well do it, I guess, if you yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys, hit thumbs up. Yeah. And yes, yeah, slam that <laughs> subscribe button and so forth. Okay, so so Justin, thank you for coming back on. This is a... Yeah, yeah, it's always a This is a fun conversation, and I hope uh, our viewers and listeners enjoyed it. And uh, so thank you again, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks.